were Chinese people uh, interesting? Because Chinese people never talk about sex. But as someone once pointed out to me, they must be having sex because there sure are a lot of them in the world. Now, Australians, on the other hand, do talk about sex, but it seems like Australians aren't having much sex. In a recent survey of 1,000 married Australians, they found that 500 out of that 1,000 have only had sex once in the last month. 100 in that 1,000 married Australians have not had sex at all in the last 12 months and 600 in that 1,000 will say, yeah, they've had sex, but it's always routine, same old, same old, same old. So today's topic is sex, and our question is this, how can we have extraordinary sex when love has gone cold? So welcome again to our May series of talks. Our four topics in this month will be justice, sex, respect, and wealth. And each week, one by one, we'll go through these topics, see what the Bible, in particular the book of Ecclesiastes, has to say about our topic. And this comes in the form of a 20-minute talk from me now, followed by about 10 minutes of question and answer from you guys. And today, again, our topic is sex. Our question is, how can we find extraordinary sex when love has gone cold? And in the Bible reading that we just had, it says this about sex. If two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And so this is poetry. This is nudge, nudge, wink, wink language for sex, love, and romance. And it's saying this is a good thing because how could we keep warm without sex, love, and romance? This is a good thing. But again, this leads us to the question, how can we find extraordinary sex when love has gone cold? So in the outline in front of us, you see there are three parts to my talk. In the first part, we'll look at, well, what is the relationship between sex and love? In the middle part of the talk, we'll look at some reasons why there isn't that much sex, even in a loving, committed relationship. And in the final part of the talk, well, some suggestions and what things the Bible might say about sex, love, and romance. So let's come to the first part of the talk. What's the relationship between sex and love? Well, a little while ago, uh, I, had, I had dinner with some friends and they served some dessert and it was a homemade cheesecake. And I was eating the cheesecake, I thought, hmm, something's a bit different about this cheesecake. And so I asked them for the recipe and they said, well, you know, there's a topping, there's a biscuit base, but for the filling, we thought instead of normal cream cheese, we just use pure butter. So I was just eating into a slab of butter and I could feel the chest pain just coming on as I was eating it. But as we know, there are three layers to a cheesecake. There's a topping, the filling, and there's a base. And psychologists tell us there are three components to a loving, romantic relationship. At the top, there's attraction. This is the physical, erotic attraction between two people. In the middle, we have companionship. This is where you become a couple an item, and soon the language changes from I to we. Instead of saying, I took her to the movies, you start talking like, we went to the movies together. You hang out together. And in the final foundational layer, there's commitment. This is where you make promises, maybe vows that you are committed to each other, and you are exclusively now a couple. And we need all three components for a loving, romantic relationship. Because if all we have is attraction, Psychologists say attraction fades after only one or two years. If all we have is companionship, well really, this is just a friendship. It's being in the friend zone. And if all we have is commitment, well, this is like a business contractual relationship. It's just duty, it's obligation, it's very cold, it's very dry. So we need all three components for a loving, romantic relationship. And there's a physiological reason for this as well. This is Helen Fisher, and she's an anthropologist. And she says what happens at a neurophysiological level is this. There's the motor drive part of our brain, and that gets us desiring and attracted to someone, and that leads to sex. Sex leads to orgasm, and then at orgasm, there's a release of powerful neurotransmitters like dopamine, 
oxytocin and vasopressin, and these neurotransmitters will make us very committed to the person. And so at a psychological and at a neurophysiological level, we have sex with those we're committed to, and we're committed to those who we have sex with. Of course we could try to have sex with those we're not committed to and not be committed to those we're having sex with. We could try that. And this is a campaign of uh, Zana Vrangelova, and she's on a campaign for casual sex where you can have casual, uncommitted sex with someone you're not committed to. But even here in her campaign, she concedes it's not easy to have casual sex. She concedes at a neurophysiological level, you will become attracted to the person and committed to the person you have sex with. She also concedes there are many drawbacks to casual sex. Uh, there's a higher rate of sexually transmitted diseases. You might have unwanted pregnancies. There's a high rate of depression and anxiety. And there's always a risk you could fall in love with a person. So these are setbacks to casual sex. She also concedes that there's a larger orgasm gap with casual sex than with sex with someone you're committed to, meaning as a woman, you're much less likely to have an orgasm with casual sex than with sex with someone you're committed to. And she concedes that with sex with someone you're committed to, alcohol is only involved 5% of the time, but with casual sex, alcohol is required 90% of the time. So that's one of those great ironies. Here is sex, which is this sensual act. And with casual sex, you need alcohol to numb the senses. So it seems, like it or not, at an anthropological, psychological, and neurophysiological level, we are designed, hardwired, to have sex with those we're committed with and to be committed to those who we have sex with. So that's the relationship between sex and love. But now we come to the middle part of the talk and we have another problem. We might be saying, well, I am in a loving, committed relationship, but there's not much sex going on. Well, there are three reasons why this happens. The first reason is this. Passion has a shelf life. Last month, I bought myself a case of Coke Zeros, and when I opened one bottle, nothing. There was no fizz, there was no flavour, because normally expect pss, an explosion of bubbles and flavour. And I thought, hang on. So I looked at the bottom of the bottle, and it was past its use-by date. They'd sold me old Coke Zeros. That's why it was called Zero. There's nothing going on in these Coke bottles. And you see, Coke has a shelf life, and passion has a shelf life. After one or two years, psychologists say we're no longer as attra attracted to our partner and they are no longer as attracted to us. The passion, the attraction fades in any and every relationship after only one or two years. And that means in our relationship we might have commitment, we might have companionship, but there's no attraction. So that's the first problem, the passion fades. The second problem is in a relationship there are competing, contradictory desires. Now, in our early years of marriage, my wife Stephanie and I used to move house a lot because we used to go from rental property to rental property. So we had to move furniture a lot. And that's when I realized my wife and I, we are completely incompatible when it comes to moving furniture. Because what my wife has crystal clear in her mind of what she's trying to do with the furniture is different from what I have crystal clearly in my mind from what I'm trying to do. So we have the piece of furniture. We might be trying to get through a door or around a hallway. And my wife is thinking she wants to move it up. I want to move it down. She wants to move it clockwise. I'm trying to move it counterclockwise. So we're always fighting, competing against each other. And the same thing's happening in a relationship. This is Esther Perel. And she says the main problem in a long-term committed relationship is this. In a relationship, there are competing desires. There's the desire for companionship. And here I'm using a minivan to represent the desire of companionship because we want something safe, reliable, practical, something with sliding doors. I'm at a stage of life right now where I look at sliding doors and I just lust after them. Oh, just have sliding doors. But in a relationship, when in our desire for companionship, we're actually having a desire for something safe, reliable, predictable, permanent, a routine, uh, somewhere where we can settle down, a home, 
permanence. That's our desire for companionship. But then there's a competing desire for sex and attraction. Here I'm using the bad boy sports car. It's actually a desire for venture, for mystery, for surprise, for danger, for risk, for travel, for the journey. And Esther Perel says these are competing desires. In the one relationship, we're wanting safety, but then we're also wanting adventure, risk and danger. We want routine, but we want mystery and surprise. And no one relationship can really juggle these two desires. And we're asking the same thing from the one partner. By day, oh, by day, by day, I want you to be safe, reliable, predictable. By day, I want you to pick up your clothes from the floor. I want you to manage the credit card bills. By day, I want you to be practical. I want you to be an accountant by day. But by night, oh, where are we going? But by night, I want you to be dangerous, mysterious, adventurous. I want you to be the pirate, the crime fighter, the superhero. And no one person can manage, can, can fulfill these two desires in us. And as a side note, Esther Perel says, this is why affairs will happen. It's not that you're unhappy with your partner or unhappy with your relationship. You can actually be very happy with your partner, be very happily married, but you're looking for an adventure, for mystery, for danger, for excitement that's no longer there or never was there. Or maybe you're happy with your partner, happy with your marriage, but you're not happy with who you've become. You're thinking, look at me. I'm dull, I'm boring, I'm predictable. This is not a who I am. I want to be alive. I want to be exciting. So it's a search for a second adolescence or maybe an adolescence we never had because I've always had to be someone for someone else. So now it's time to be me, to be who I really am. And that's how affairs happen, uh, no matter how happy we might be with our partner or our marriage because there's this juggle of competing desires in our, in our relationship. The third reason why... Uh, sex might fade in a long-term committed relationship is this. There's an asymmetry in desire. Now, I love uh, watching young couples when they're dating and when they're in love because it's like they're in Disneyland. And they were saying, oh, we're so perfect for each other. We're exactly the same. We like eating in the same restaurants. We like watching movies together. We like long walks by the beach. I'm going, of course you're compatible. Like anyone likes eating in restaurants. Anyone likes watching movies. Anyone likes going to the beach. Of course you're compatible, but wait till you get married because when you get married, that's not Disneyland. When you get married, that's like running a small business together now. It's all about cash flow. It's all about human resources, who's going to pick up the kids from school. It's all about rosters and dishwasher management, who's going to unstack the dishwasher. And that's where you're going to find you're incompatible because we have different ways of managing money, different ways of managing time, and different ways of stacking a dishwasher. Every time I stack a dishwasher, my wife comes around and restacks it behind my back. <laughs> so we're completely incompatible. And Michelle Weiner Davis says, we will also be incompatible in our desires for sex. There's an asymmetry in desire. One partner will always want sex more than the other partner. There will be asymmetry. And the partner who wants it less, and it could be equally the man or the woman, but the partner who wants it less, they now control how much sex happens in the relationship. They have the power. And then this person might feel resentment, bitterness and hurt and words will be said and these words will drive this person even further away and now you're definitely getting no sex in the relationship. So there are reasons why there's not much sex happening long-term, committed, happy, loving relationships. So let's come to the third part of the talk. Well, what are some ways forward? What are some suggestions? Well, let's go with number one. And this comes from Michelle Weiner Davis. She says, just do it. Just do it. And what she means by this is, she's, is this. She says, normally the sequence should be we have desire for someone, then that leads to arousal, and that leads to sex. But in a long-term committed relationship, desire usually fades. Passion fades, and so now there's no arousal, now there's no sex. But she says in a long-term committed relationship, usually you have to flip it the other way around. Just begin with a sex, and that will lead to arousal, and that will lead to desire. And suddenly, as a couple, you think, hang on, 
This is fun. That's why we enjoy doing this. Just do it and you remember how fun it is to do. And the Bible says the same thing. This is Paul in the New Testament writing to the Christians in Corinth. He says this, Do not deprive each other of sexual relations, unless you both agree for a limited time so you can pray, but afterward you should come together again. And Paul is saying, don't deprive each other. He's writing to married Christians and saying, hey, you know, just do it and you remember how much you enjoy it. And think of it as this dynamic. You are serving, you're giving pleasure to the partner that you love. Just start doing it. But I love the next bit. And what must be happening is the Christians in Corinth say, oh, but Paul, but Paul, we don't do sex because we would prefer to read the Bible together as a married couple and pray and Paul, almost as a concession, says, okay, uh, okay, you can read the Bible and pray, but for a limited time only. Uh, so, so set the oven timer for 10 minutes, and when you finish reading the Bible and praying, I want you to come back together and have sex. Just do it, and you remember how much you enjoyed it. So that's the first tip. Uh, just do it. The second tip is this. There are things, there are behaviours we can do that can reignite the passions. And this is Terry Orbach in her book, Finding Love Again. And she's saying there are behaviours that can reignite the passions. There are, because what we're after is something new, something adventurous. So do something new together. She says, how about uh, signing up for a course that we've never done before? Uh, how about going to a new restaurant in a new part of town? Sign up for a cooking class. Do something new that you've never done before. And it's also behaviours that are slightly naughty will reignite the passions. So do something naughty. Like just be caught out in the rain without an umbrella, even though you knew it was going to rain. Or during the day, send each other little naughty, flirty text messages. And what's interesting, my wife's name is Stephanie. And one of the surgeons I work for, his secretary is called Stephanie. Yeah. So one day during the day, I sent my wife a text message and I sent it to the surgeon's secretary by mistake. And then she replied, I think you meant this for someone else. <laughs> and I said, oh, thank goodness, it was just a traffic report. I was saying, well, Concord Road's really busy. Huh? You should go another way. <laughs> Phew! But do something naughty during the day. She says, do something surprising. Maybe just turn up at random. Uh, to, to your partner's workplace and just take them out for lunch. A uh, mystery, uh, have a mystery date. Go to a location that's a surprise or a surprise party. Something surprising, something mysterious. Do something physical together, like go to the gym or go for a run together or go rock climbing together. Do something dangerous, like abseil, jump out of a plane, watch a scary movie. Do something that gets you laughing, like watch comedy or watch a, a, a funny movie but there are behaviours which we can do that can reignite the passions. And the Bible says the same thing. In that reading that we had in Ecclesiastes, it says this. Go, eat your food with gladness, drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. It says go, go on a date night, go to a restaurant, eat, drink, do something together that will reignite the passions. Then it says, always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. In other words, just put some effort in how you look. Guys, please get out of the tracksuit pants. Put some slim fit jeans on. Uh, put some product in your hair. Style your hair. You know, make an effort and clean yourselves. Clean your fingernails. Use soaps. Use lotions. Use perfumes. Put some effort in how you look. And then it says, and enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this, and I think the better translation is, all the days of this brief life that God has given you under the sun. It's saying, come on, enjoy life together. You've only got a brief time together. You know, my wife and I have been married 19 years now, and I'm just amazed because it's, it's gone so quickly. And it's just made me realize how brief life is and how brief life together will be. So because it's so brief, the Bible is saying, enjoy. Enjoy your marriage. Enjoy your partner. Because it's only a brief time and it's a good gift from a good God to enjoy. So just get together and enjoy each other. So that's the second tip. There are behaviours we can do that can reignite the passions. And the third tip from the Bible is this. How do we manage these competing desires for safety and adventure? Well, I remember watching the movie American Beauty. It won Best Movie at the Oscars a few years ago. And it looks at the marriage of Kevin Spacey 
and Annette Benning. And they're in this typical relationship where the passion has gone cold. They've been married 10, 20 years, and there's not much sex. There's not much passion happening anymore until one night they're in the living room and somehow the passions are reignited and they come together, they embrace, clothes come off and they're just about to make wild, passionate love when she pulls back and says, whoa, 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 we're going to mess up the furniture. And at that moment, I totally got it. I got it. I said, yep, I'm so with you on this one. I get, you know, sex, but, you know, it's very pleasurable. But hang on, this is a $1,000 piece of furniture we're talking about. And the, being the Asian, I'm thinking, you know, we've got to protect our furniture. It's got to last 10, 20 years. And we might scratch the floor. Come on, I know sex is fun, but let's be practical here. I know we want to be wild, but we need to be sensible at the same time. So it's the same problem. And how do we juggle these desires for safety but danger in our relationship. Well, I think the Bible hints at the answer here. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. So this is the business part of the marriage. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. So that's the companionship part. If also two lie down together, they will keep warm. That's a sex part. So how are we going to hold these desires and these demands together? Well, one may be overpowered, so one person's not going to be able to do it. Two can defend themselves, so that might work. But hey, even better, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You know, this is too much for a couple to, to, to manage by themselves. We're going to need help here. We're going to need a third person to help us. How do we juggle the demands for safety and a venture at the same time. Well, I think this is where the New Testament hints that Jesus comes along and he can be both our security and our adventure at the same time. Because Jesus comes and he says, come to me all who are tired and I will give you rest. I'll give you security. I'll give you a home. You can settle and you can find rest in me. This is the security you're looking for. But at the same time, Jesus gives us the danger that we're looking for. Jesus says, hey, come, follow me. Give up everything you have and follow me. In fact, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me on this journey where foxes have holes, animals have places to sleep, but you and I will have no place to sleep. So Jesus gives us the excitement, the adventure that we're looking for. And that means we can enjoy our partner Enjoy our marriage just for what it is, a good gift from God, no more, no less, because Jesus is the security and the adventure that we're looking for. I remember reading a book that, that said this, don't make your wife the adventure, make Jesus the adventure, and your wife is someone you bring along on the adventure. Because if I try to make my wife the adventure, she would never be exciting enough. There's just too much of a demand to put on her, and I will blame her. If only you were more exciting and more exotic, and I will blame myself as well. Oh, if only I was more exciting. If only I was more sophisticated, more witty, more charming, more learned. Then this would be a great marriage. And we blame each other, blame ourselves, blame the marriage. But instead, if we make Jesus the adventure, Jesus is security, and then my partner, my marriage, I can just enjoy just for what they are, a good gift from God, and we go on the journey with Jesus together. Well, do you remember our original question? It was this. How can we have extraordinary sex when love has gone cold? And today we look for some reasons why not much sex might happen, even over a very happy, loving, committed relationship, and we've looked at some suggestions. Let me just end with this story. I remember watching Breaking Bad, and this was season one, episode one. And it ended with this nighttime scene where we, have the, we look at the marriage between Walter White and his wife, Skylar. And it ended with this scene that it's the end of the day, they're in bed together, and Walter looks at his wife, Skylar, and says, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, what about it? And then they have sex, but it was so mechanical. There was no love. There was no passion. And it just made you cringe. You thought, this is awful. And something in us says, you know, sex should not be like that. With sex, there should also be love, passion, and romance. But where do we get this idea from? See, the anthropologist, and I'm getting this from Helen Fisher, and she's not a Christian, so she's got no Christian agenda. But she says humans are unique. 
Because out of all the animals on this planet, only humans think that sex, love, and romance should go together. For animals, sex is just sex. It's mechanical. It's just molecules. It's just neurotransmitters. You're just propagating your DNA. It's just about survival of the species. But as humans, somehow we sense this should be more than just neurotransmitters. This should be more than just me propagating my DNA. This is more than just survival of the species. There should be love. There should be romance. There should be passion. That's what makes sex, sex. But where do we get this idea? Well, the Bible says we get this idea because God has designed sex, love, and romance to be a model of his love for us. My boys love playing with Lego, and every time I come home, they go, Dad, Dad, look at this car I've just made. And I say, yeah, that, that looks fantastic. Look at the car you've just made. But you know what? It's not a real car. It's just a model of a car. And God gives us love, sex, and romance as a model. So no matter how much sex we're having or not having, no matter how much sex we're enjoying or not enjoying, sex, love, and romance are a model from God for the greater love, the greater passion, the greater romance that God has for us. And so the key, our story in life is this, to enjoy this passionate, loving relationship with God. We have a God who made us, and he loves us, and he's passionately in love with us, and he asks us to love him back, to trust him, and to be just as exclusive with him as he is with us. Thank you. Uh, before we go to the floor, a couple from SMS. Um, is there a reason why sex is limited to a married couple? Um, so I'm single, am I missing out? Is my love always cold? Oh, three okay. questions there for you. Wow, wow, so three or four questions all in one. I'll try to tease them out. So let's take the, the first one on about singleness and, and, and marriage. Uh, we know, so as much as I've talked about sex and marriage today, we know there's more to the human story than just sex and marriage because Jesus was single and Paul talks about being single uh, as, as, a, as a great thing. So he seems to prefer singleness to sex and marriage. So there's more to the human story than just sex and marriage. Also, there's more to the story than just sex and marriage because people who are married seem to be, can, just, can seem to still get just as lonely and isolated even in a marriage as people who are single. So there's more to the human story than just sex and marriage. So the Bible hints at, you know, uh, we also need love and belonging, not just in a marriage, but also in a community. And we find ultimate love and belonging with God. So there's more to the human story. And the, the more is we find ultimate love and belonging with God. There's also the question, well, does sex have to be in a committed, loving, married relationship? Where do we get these ideas from? Well, the bigger question is, where do we get any ideas? Where do we get any rules? Where do we get any laws from? And rules and laws exist usually uh, to ensure that we do things according to the design and purpose of an activity. So when we watch a movie, they always put up that rule, do not talk on your mobile phones during the movie. And at that point, none of us roll our eyes and go, oh, why do we have this rule? Now, we know that with this rule, uh, then we're ensuring the design and purpose of watching a movie, we're maximising the pleasure, we're protecting the innocent, and we're ensuring public good. At that point, we happily turn off our phones. And it's the same, we get these guidelines that, you know, we should have sex with those we're committed to and committed to those we have sex with. And rather than just roll our eyes and say, oh, who comes up with these rules, realise what well, this actually goes on the design and purpose of sex and, and relationships. As we've seen, we've been hard wired this way, at least in a psychological and a physiological way. And this ensures maximum pleasure, a maximum good, minimises harm, and ensures public good. What's interesting, it's not just the Bible that recognises this, but most people recognise this. So what's interesting is we could try to say, okay, I'm going to have sex with someone I'm not committed to, but after a while, the question comes up, should we move in together? I mean, if we're having sex together, we should move in together. And there's always that awkward moment where one person think, why, is thinking, why have we moved in together yet? Why have we moved in together yet? And they eventually move in together. And then eventually, you know, the relationship progresses. And sometimes if the relationship breaks up after 12 months, the government actually kicks in and says, hang on, you guys want a de facto relationship and you start dividing the assets 50-50. So as much as we want to say, you know, we can have uncommitted, commitment-free sex, even the government recognises, no, 
This is a relational act where there are uh, obligations and responsibilities. So I think the reason why these things exist is we're recognising sex is more than just a biological, physiological act. It's a relational act. When I eat donuts, I'm fill it, fulfilling a biological desire, but there aren't many government regulations about how I eat a donut. But when I have sex, we're recognising, hang on, this is more just a biological, physiological act. This is a relational act, and with relational acts, there are obligations and responsibilities. And that's why laws exist, to ensure those responsibilities and protect the innocent from being harmed. Thanks, Sam. Sure. Um, another question has come through via SMS. Uh, there are some great tips on relationships here. Uh, do you have any ideas for how you might package this talk uh, to actually in a conversation with people who aren't Christian, who have agreed to have sort of an open relationship, so to, to have affairs within their marriage. How would you take this and okay. speak into that situation? Oh, wow. So how, how would we take this? Well, interesting. most psychologists, most counsellors, even without the Bible, recognise that affairs are very damaging. There's so much hurt done, and, and, and many parties get hurt. Many parties get hurt. So... Um, just using a, a design and consequentialist argument, I would be enough to say warn people against why we shouldn't have affairs, shouldn't have open relationships, even in a, in a committed thing. And um, even, even the lady arguing for casual sex says, says there's a high rate of sexually transmitted diseases, you have unwanted pregnancies, there's a high rate of depression and anxiety. So it just seems to go against how we're designed. And then trust is violated, people are hurt. And if there are children involved, um, then it gets, you know, a lot of people get hurt. So I think just from a loving point of view, it just seems to be a thing that's going to hurt a lot of people. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Um, so following on from that, um, also from your earlier answer, so the Bible reading we had earlier said, God has already approved what you do, uh, so why can't I have sex with whoever I want? All right. So God has already approved what you do. Uh, I think what, I'd look at how that word approved is being... Um, translated, but I think it's God has given us good things to enjoy, but we're meant to enjoy them according to his design and purpose. And that's what Ecclesiastes is arguing. There are many gifts given to us by God, and they're good gifts. Don't make any more of them than what they are, but don't make any less of them than they are. These are good gifts, and they're meant to be enjoyed according to God's design and purpose. I'll just see if there's any questions from the floor before I go back to the SMS questions. Okay, uh, Sam, if Jesus is my safety and adventure, how should I view my wife? Right, yes, that's right. Well, I think what it is, is there are many good gifts that God gives us, and here we're talking about sex and marriage, and the big theme in Ecclesiastes, they're good gifts, so don't make any less of them than what they are, but certainly don't make any more of them than what they are, meaning don't make them your identity, your purpose, and your security. And often we do that with sex and marriage, like with, with my partner, with my marriage, here's my identity, here's my purpose, this is my trophy family, this is how I'm going to be somebody in this society. And the Bible says, no, 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 no. You will destroy your family if you put that demand on them and you will destroy yourself as well. Jesus is your identity, your purpose, your, your security. And because you've already got Jesus, your identity, purpose and security, now you're free to enjoy your marriage just for what it is. Uh, people enjoying companionship in a committed, loving, romantic relationship. Cool, thanks. Um, so again, a related question. So how is Jesus the adventure? Uh, doesn't being a Christian get dull sometimes? Mm. Uh, and following Jesus doesn't sound like an adventure. I know plenty of boring Christians. Right, okay. <laughs> well, just like sex and romance should be exciting, but there are many boring relationships. It's the same with uh, following Jesus. I don't think we're juggling that dual, ten dual tension because Jesus says, I will be your rest. So in Jesus, we find security and we can be settled. And finally, we can stop searching and we can find a home in Jesus. But at the same time, Jesus says this is an adventure. What I like is Jesus says, I'm the truth, the way and the life. And as Christians, often we focus on truth. Jesus is a truth to believe, true or false. But there's a big emphasis in the New Testament that he's also the way and he's the life. He's a way to live. And the early Christian followers were called followers of the way. So this is a journey with Jesus. It doesn't stop with just believing in him and believing facts about him. No, we've just been swept along on a journey. And Jesus' big uh, call to conversion isn't just pray a prayer. He's saying, I want you now to come on a journey with me. Deny yourself, leave everything behind and come with me. And who knows where he's going to take us. So it's an adventure. 
And, and what, the more you read the Bible, you realize God never works in a straight line from point A to B. He takes us on a, a wild, crazy journey. So every day is a new day with Jesus, and it's very exciting. Great. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for answering the questions. No and thanks for the talk today. Thanks. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks for coming along to this uh, second of our May talks. Join us next week uh, as we look at respect. And Sam's going to uh, bring us a, a talk on what the Bible says about respect. And he may even sing uh, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. I've heard him practicing. I think he's doing pretty all right. But if you pay we'll me enough, to... I'll sing next week. Excellent. So look forward to that. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.